scans and what types of images that it makes. And we finished off here, we were talking about how the, the lens changes and how it changes with the eye when you're looking at things that are either far away or nearby. So if I'm looking at something that's really far away, then uh, when the light rays reach me, they're parallel, and those parallel rays are going to focus at the focal point because that's what a convex lens does. And so the focal point of this lens will be at the retina because that's where your, your image is always going to be at the retina, okay? Uh, and so when the object is far away, your focal point is at the retina. But if I have an object that's nearby, my image is still at the retina, but in order to get it at the retina, the focal length has to decrease. So if it's far away, the focal length is at the retina. As it moves closer, the focal length moves closer to the lens. Uh, you can think about it in terms of object distance. Like when object distance is big, focal length is big. And then as this moves in, the focal point also moves in. If that helps you remember it. It also works out mathematically that if we look at the lens equation, that 1 over f equals 1 over do plus 1 over di, this value is always constant for the eye. The image is always at the retina, unless you have some issue. And we'll talk about that, myopia, presbyopia, several other sort of issues with the eye, farsightedness, nearsightedness. Um, where the image doesn't form at the retina. But for a normal eye, the image distance is always constant. It's always at the retina. Notice that if I let this decrease, then this is also going to decrease. So if DO gets small, F is going to get small. So if you forget, you can just look at the equation and think about how those things change if you forget sort of this argument. But you'll probably see an, a question about this describing what happens to image uh, your focal length of your eye. And then also don't forget we said that when our focal length is big, that means that our lens is thin in the middle. When my focal length is small, that means my lens is wide in the middle. All right, uh, let's look at the parts of the eye. You'll probably cover this in anatomy. Do you cover the eye in anatomy? Yeah? Okay, so you've probably seen most or all of this and maybe even more. But the eye is a sphere. Pretty good sphere, actually. Pretty much uh, spherical shaped. Um, it's filled with clear liquids. In fact, we talked about these earlier when we were talking about pressure. Remember the beagle with the tonometer that he used to measure the pressure in the eye? He used to measure the pressure in the eye. Uh, these clear liquids are called the vitreous humor. And the uh, aqueous humor. Uh, the eye contains the lens. Or this sphere contains the lens. And the ciliary body. I'll show you a picture of this in a video, sort of going through the eye. The ciliary body uh, changes the shape of the eye. Actually, it changes the shape of the, the lens, right? I have an eye written here. Yeah, changes the shape of the lens. We'll talk about that changes that focal length, these muscles in the eye, it changes the lens. Um, I have a figure here, let me pull it up. There's a figure in your book too, and you had a figure actually on your, um, well, I say that, let me pull one up on, online.
Oh, here it is. This is the actually the figure from your from your test that you had. So spherical shape. This is the ciliary body. It changes the shape of your lens. This is the lens. Again, there's a figure in your book, but this is a good figure as well. Uh, the ciliary body can make the focal length small, or it can stretch this out and make it big, or make the focal length bigger. Um, let's see, what else do we say? We'll get to these other parts in just a bit. We have three layers to the wall of the eye. have the uh, fibrous, which is the outside layer. This contains the sclera. This is the white part of your eye. There's a kid in my daughter's class, and he can do this thing where he rolls his eyes back into his head. Have you ever seen this? And then he opens them, so it's like all you can see are the whites of his eyes. It's kind of creepy. Can any of y'all do that? No. He's pretty talented, Levi. No, he like, it's like he just sort of rolls his eyes back. Can you see the whites? I don't know. I can't do it. But he rolls his, so you can't see the pupils. All you can see is the sclera, just the white part of the eye. So the What's that? Yeah, he's 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 something. All right, and also the uh, the outer part also has the cornea, and this is the clear part. So on this outer layer, with the fibrous layer, we have the sclera, that's the white part, and the cornea. I'm going to go back to that figure, but I'll come back to this. So our cornea is right here. This is our cornea, and as I said before, when light comes in, most of the bending occurs at the cornea. A little bit of bending might occur at the lens, but most of the bending, most of the refraction occurs when you travel from air to our cornea because the index of refraction is so much different going from air to the cornea. Uh, the next part is the vascular layer. Uh, the vascular layer is also called the uvea. It consists of the choroid, the ciliary body, and the iris. Uh, the choroid contains blood vessels. It takes nutrients to your eye, the things that your eye needs to function. The ciliary body is a muscle that changes the shape of the lens. And the iris, well, what does the iris do? I think this, was this on your quiz? Maybe it was, I forget. What does the iris do? It changes the size of your eye. It allow it's an aperture that changes the amount of light that goes into your eye. You'll need to know all these different parts. Like you had on the quiz, you'll have, again, uh, this figure with the words off of it, and you'll need to know the different parts of the eye. So again, uh, let's see. Here's our choroid. It has the blood vessels. That's the middle part of the eye. Uh, the ciliary body is this. It's the muscles that can change the shape of this lens. It can stretch it out, or it can push it so it's wide in the middle and make the focal length shorter. And then uh, the iris right here is this part that can actually change the amount of light that goes into the eye. Make sure pupil is bigger or smaller. The pupil is the whole. All right? Yes.
What is the image like in your book? Do you have it up? It'll be like this one. This is the one I gave you in your quiz. So uh, if you just Google the eye, you'll pull up this figure as well. Or if you want, you can send me an email. I'll shoot it to you. All right. Uh, this has all the different parts that we're, yeah, this has all the different parts that we're concerned with. Okay, so if you know all the parts that are on this diagram, you'll be good to go for the test. Or not for the whole test, but for that, uh, that part of the test. Okay, uh, in the third part, the third layer, remember there are three layers, is the sensory layer. It actually senses the light. Uh, it's the innermost layer. It contains the retina. And the retina converts the light to an electrical signal. Uh, it contains rods and cones. Uh, rods are for low light. These are for uh, like black and white situations. And then cones are for bright lights. And this is for color. So our cones detect vivid colors more readily than the rods do. That's why when you go outside on a real sunny day and you go you know, out in the quad and you see the green of the grass and the colors on the building, but if you go outside at nighttime or at dusk when the sun is starting to go down, then those colors become very muted, right? And especially at night, you don't see the colors at all. But especially at dusk, when you can still see the objects, you can't really distinguish their colors. And that's because the, uh, the rods are being activated at dusk or at dawn. And so you, you're really more sensitive to black and white colors than to, to colors. You don't need to write this down, but it's my understanding that babies, too, they have more rods than cones when they're born, so they're more sensitive to black and white colors. Okay. Um, people who are colorblind, Uh, are missing some of these cones. So in these cones, you have different colors. So cones that are particularly sensitive to different colors. We have RGB cones, right? RGB stands for what? You know, like an RGB color palette. Right, red, green, and blue. So in a similar way, if when we talk about RGB colors, our cones are can be sensitive to either red, to green, or to blue. So somebody that's colorblind is missing one or more of these colors. My son is colorblind. I think he's like red, green, colorblind, that he can't distinguish between those two. But you can be different kinds. Okay, um... Retina also contains the fovea and the optic disc. Can I go down from here? Yeah. Uh, it also contains the fovea and the optic disc. Uh, the fovea is at the back of the highball. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think that they just know the order of them. I don't know much about color blindness. Does anybody know much about that, about color blindness and how it affects people? Yeah, I should know better since my son is color blind. But I know that he has he has trouble distinguishing blue from purple. So it might be that he's I don't know what he is, but anyway, he's color blind. He can't tell blue from purple. So like he would look at this shirt and probably call it purple. Or he might call it blue. He said he doesn't really know. Like, he'll look at it and he just can't really tell. All right? Uh, so anyway, the optic disc is where the optic nerve is attached to the retina. And 
Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't finish the fovea. So the fovea is at the back of the eye. Um, it has a high concentration of cones. So just in that part of the eye, there's a lot of cones. Let's look at the picture. Uh, the fovea is right here. And so as you might expect, it's in the center of the eye. And this is where your image is going to form most of the time. Sometimes the image will be bigger in this part, right? It'll spread out. But the main image is formed here at the fovea. And that's why you have more cones there. So you can distinguish colors more readily and, and just produce a better image for your eye. Um, so that's the fovea, or it's called the fovea centralis there, it's the central fovea. Uh, the optic disc is where the optic nerve attaches to the retina. There are no cones here. Uh, though if you look at the image, or the diagram, this is our uh, optic disc right here. So it's pretty close to the fovea, and there are no cones at all in this place. So when you look at something, you do get an image that covers part of the, uh, the optic disc, but there are no cones, so your brain can't process that information at all. There's just no signal at all. But your brain will fill in that image. So you have a blind spot there in your eye, but we don't really detect it because our brain just sort of fills in the image. So it's like, that's not this, I mean, the blind spot's a little bitty, but it's like, you know, Harley and Mariah are missing, but my brain just sort of fills in where they are. Okay? But it's an itty-bitty blind spot. It's, it's not that big. Okay, so um, there are no cones here, but your brain fills in the rest of the image. All right, we have two types of liquid in the eye. We talked about this. Or I gave you the names. Two types of liquid, but you do need to know the difference between them and the purpose that they serve. There's the aqueous humor. Uh, this is between the lens and the cornea. Uh, this liquid replenishes. So it will drain away and be replenished over time. Uh, we discussed that when we were in that chapter on fluids, how this aqueous humor can, uh, can replenish. And if it doesn't drain properly, then you have issues with that. Uh, I think that was glaucoma, right? Is that glaucoma? I think that was right. Anyway, it replenishes and changes over time. Um, it brings nutrients and flushes waste to your eye. Yeah, and so if you have too much pressure here, this is called glaucoma. Right, so that's the aqueous humor. Let me show you on that picture again. It's between the lens and the cornea. So if I'm looking at this picture, that aqueous humor is between the lens and the cornea. It's going to be right here. That's my aqueous humor in between the lens and the cornea. Right. The other is the, uh, the vitreous humor. is not replenished. And so whatever you're born with is what you have. Um, and it just helps to keep the shape of the eyeball. Uh, 
Or if you didn't have that, your eyeball would just deflate. So the vitreous humor is not replenished, not replenished, and it just helps keep the shape of the eyeball. I think that's pretty remarkable that your eye, however old you are, that that's how old your vitreous humor is inside your eye. Your eye doesn't really get that much bigger, too, so that's why babies have the big eyes. Right? Um, so the vitreous humor is just all in here. This is our vitreous humor. Uh, I don't know of a good way to distinguish those like in your mind. Does anybody have any mnemonic or whatever to help you to remember the aqueous and vitreous humors? No, I don't either. Just sort of know them, whatever way you do. If you come up with a good mnemonic to remember that, please let me know. I'd like to know that too. <laughs> All right. Um, let's look at the path of light into the eye. Actually, I want to show you a video first. Okay, so let's look at the path of light into the eye, the next section in your book. Uh, and they talk about here, the main idea really, and I've already mentioned this, that uh, most of the refraction occurs at the air cornea interface. And if you notice in that video as well, when they showed the refraction, uh, that was true as well. The most refraction occurs at the air cornea interface. So if I look at my eye, it looks like this. Um, let's see, that's not what it looks like at all. I have a sphere. Right, I have a, uh, a cornea right here. And then inside, I have that little lens. Right, light rays that come in, they're going to bend the most going into the cornea. And then from there, they'll bend a little bit to go back to the retina in whatever way. So most of the refraction occurs right there because I'm going from an index of refraction of 1 to an index of refraction of about 1.3 or so. But for the most part, the refraction inside the eye is pretty much the same. Right? Bending of light only occurs when you move from an index that's different from the one that you're moving into. And so that's true, too, for the lens, that the index of refraction of the lens is pretty darn close to the index of the rest of the eye. But that's nice because it means that you don't have to change the shape of the lens very much to fine-tune where that light goes. So when we say that we change the focal length of the lens, we're only changing it just a little bit. All right? Um, yeah, I think that's all we need to know for that section. They also mention here in this, in this section, actually, that the, uh, the index of refraction, that's our value for n, for the aqueous humor, and the vitreous humor, that this is very close to that of water. All right. Um, there's a section comparing the eye to a camera. Now, I'll go on to the next page. The eye and the camera are very similar, but they are different, too, in the way that they function. So in an eye, this is our eye. For an eye, the image distance is fixed. And you change the focal length. So you can, uh, f is variable. And with a camera, my lens is here. I have my film here. For a camera, uh, the focal length is fixed, and the image distance is variable. So you can't change the focal length of your lens in a camera unless you, uh, you know, physically change the actual lens. But you can change the distance between the lens and the uh, the film. So if we think about the camera in a similar way as what we did for a lens, or for, a, for the eye. For a camera, here's my lens, here's my film, if I, or my, my chip, or whatever it is, a CCD chip. If I have an object that's really far away, these light rays are going to come in, 
and they're going to focus at the focal point, like that. Now, if I have something that's close, my focal point still remains the same. Unlike for the eye, the focal point will remain the same. And so if I move my object up close, what am I going to do to the film? Am I going to move the film inside of the focal point, or will I move the film outside, away from the lens? Which direction will I move the film in this case? Let's do it as a clicker question. So if I'm looking at something like this, will I move the film further from the lens? Or will I move the film closer to the lens? That is, will I move it in this direction? Or will I move it in this direction if I'm looking at something that's up close? Think about what you do. Well, you can think about your camera, too, and what it does. Right? What does your camera do when you look at something up close? Does it uh, make this distance closer, or does it make this distance further away? I'm going to pass around the model of the eye. Some of you got to see it last time, but you can take it apart and look at all the different parts that we've been talking about. Yeah, some of you saw it already, but... Okay. Okay, we'll stop at uh, 48. Let's try it again. If you have your camera, about half of you got it wrong. So if you have your camera and you want to look at something that's far away, like you want to take an image of something that's far away, what do we call that on a camera? What do we do with the camera? We do what? We zoom in, right? So think about what your camera does, right? Does it take the lens and move it out, or does it take the lens and move it in? And basically what you're doing is moving the film out or moving it in when you're doing that. So let's try it one more time. Think about it. About seven or eight of you had the wrong answer. You can ask your neighbor if you like. All right, we'll stop at uh, 22. 25, I guess. Are you on and click in? What's the question? Well, it doesn't really matter. So if I'm moving it further, that means I'm increasing this distance. If I'm moving it closer, that means I'm decreasing this distance. You can think about it as either moving the film or moving the lens. Either way is fine. Usually on a camera, you're actually moving the lens, right, not the film. All right. Uh, let's stop at 105. Is that, are you all still confused? Really? Okay. Let me, let me try to explain it again, and then if you're still confused, just let me know. So uh, here I have a lens. I have an object that's really far away. That image is going to form at the focal point. This focal point doesn't move. So the lens, this focal point, it's always the same. Now, if I have, if I bring an object up close, right, if I bring an object that's up close, I want to know what happens to the, uh, to the orientation of the lens and the film. Does the film need to be further back behind the focal point? That would be A. Or does the film need to be up closer to the lens? That would be B, right? So I'm asking about when I'm looking at an object that's up close, where does my film need to be? Does it need to be further away from the lens? That would be like the lens coming out. Or does it need to be closer into the lens? I think maybe I misspoke earlier. Is that more clear to you? What happens to the film? Does it get closer to the lens? That would be B. Or further away from the lens? when the object is up close. All right? Uh, now I'm thoroughly confused. Okay, I'm going to stop it and I'll show you the answer. Okay, B is right. It does get... Wait, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. Yes, it moves further away. A is right. Yeah. 
Yeah, y'all ha- y'all did it better on the first one. I think I just confused you even more. I <laughs> now let me draw the ray diagrams for you, okay? Maybe that'll help. Look, if I draw my ray diagrams, it goes parallel to the axis, and then it goes through the focal point like that. And then it goes through the focal point and parallel to the axis. So the image of something that's up close is going to be back here. Right? And that's what happens when you zoom in on something that's... Yeah, F is the focal point, right? That's for the eye. This is not the eye. This is a camera. And so that's the point, is that the eye and the camera are different. The eye, the focal length changes. For a camera, the image distance changes. Okay? Because your your image always forms at the retina. Your image distance for the eye is always the diameter of your eyeball. For a camera, the image distance is variable. I can take that lens and move it back and forth. Okay? Sort of, kind of? Yeah, no, this is for the, uh, the camera, as far as I was confusing. Is that okay? Yeah, get it? No, okay. Let me, let me start on a new page. Let's look at the eye. It is kind of important, actually. So imagine the eye. So here's the eye. The focal length for the eye changes. If something is really far away, the focal point of the eye is back here. Because light rays will come, and they'll focus at the focal point. If something is really close, like right here, the focal point moves in. I can think of my rays parallel the axis through the focal point. They will cross, and they'll form an image back here. So nearby, the focal point gets smaller. Far away, the focal point gets longer. Yes, so uh, when the object is far away, is distant, the focal point is uh, large. When the object is near, the focal point is small. Or if you want to think about it in terms of uh, our variables, if di, or excuse me, do is big, f is big. When do is small, f is small. Right? Because this distance is always fixed. Our di is always fixed. And then we also said, you can think about this in terms of the lens equation, 1 over f is 1 over do, so it's 1 over di. All right, if uh, di is constant, this doesn't change. So if do goes down, f will also go down. If my object distance gets smaller, my focal length will get smaller too. And the focal length is never going to get bigger than the, the diameter of your eyeball, okay, because that's something that's infinite distance away. Now for a camera, similar but different, for a camera, here's my lens, film. This is for a camera. This is my film. This is my lens. When an object is far away, the focal point is at the film. So when an object is far away, oh, let me, let me, I'll put it in words in just a second. Then if I have an object that's nearby, I want the film to be where the image will be formed. So here, my object is nearby. I think about my rays. They go parallel to the axis, through the focal point, through the focal point, parallel to the axis. So my image is going to be formed back here. So my film will now be back here. 
Okay. Now that I think about it, that's not really intuitive with the camera. Like, it seems that your camera is actually doing something else, right? Yeah, maybe that's what confused you. Because that's, that's not really what it seems like the camera is doing. Okay? Um, so, we put this in words. When the object is distant, the film is close. Or we can think about our lens equation. 1 over f is 1 over po plus 1 over di. Here, f is constant. So if our object distance goes up, that means di has to go down. You follow this? So if they're on the same side of the equation, it's an inverse relationship. Now, when the object is close, the film is far away. Right, and remember this, the location of the film, this is our di. It's the image distance. The image has to form at the film or you won't get a, an image at all. And again, you can think about the lens equation. 1 over f is 1 over do plus 1 over di. f is constant, so if do goes down, that means di has to go up. Is that a little more clear, y'all? You probably see it on the test, actually. So, some uh, one or two questions about this. Dealing both with the eye and the camera. It's useful for you to understand them because if you understand one, then you can understand the other. Okay? And being able to distinguish between them is important. Okie dokie? Yes? Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's look at our near and far point. And then a few problems that we have with vision. Can I go down from here? Okay, so the near and far point. Um, these are just the nearest and furthest points that you can see. The near point is set by the most curved position of the lens. By the maximum curvature of the lens. Because remember, go back to that figure that we had before. I'll come right back to this. But, uh, when I have an object that is really near, my focal point gets small. A s uh, small focal length, does that mean that it's thin in the middle or wide in the middle, the lens? A small focal point. It's wide. So a, a lens with a, a short focal point is very wide in the middle. And there is a limit to what your ciliary body can actually adjust that lens. And that limit tells us what our near point is. So this maximum curvature is what the ciliary body can give to that lens, how much it can push down on that lens to make it as wide as possible in order to look at something that's up really close. Usually the near point, um, do I have a ruler in here? I do not. But usually the near point is about 10 or 20 centimeters. You can take your finger like this and just hold it out and then bring it in. And at some point, for it's for me right about here, take your finger and then just bring it in. And when it goes fuzzy, that's where your near point is. So you all have pretty short near point. They say for a typical, you know, a healthy human, is that your near point? <laughs> now there is another hard limit to what your near point is, right? And that's, if you think about your convex lens, and we saw this before, This is not your near point, but if we think about our eye, remember we can't see an object that's inside the focal point because that's going to create a, uh, a virtual image. And you can't project a virtual image onto your eye. 
Now your focal point for your lens and your eye is right about here, right? Because the width of your eyeball is about that far. The focal length at its longest is at the back of the eye. And so the, your focal point is about this far away from your eye. So anything inside that, there's, it's impossible for you to see, even if your ciliary body could squish down your lens enough to make the focal length short enough, because you can only create a virtual image inside the focal point. Remember those figures that we drew, the different types of images you can form with a convex lens? Yeah, so your focal, you, you begin to lose it, uh, your near point at about 10 or 20 centimeters, about this far to maybe this far away from your eye. Okay, the far point is the furthest you can see. Um, typically, your far point is infinity. Uh, which infinity is sort of, it's not really infinity. It means something that's really far away, something that's much bigger than your focal length. So, for example, if I was looking from here, even to the back of the room, we would consider that to be infinity because it's a distance that is much, much larger than the focal length of my eye. So, really, when we say uh, infinity, it just means that the object distance has to be much, much bigger than the focal length. And the focal length of your eye depends on your eye, but it's about one to two centimeters. So, if I'm, say, a hundred times that, or 200 times that, or 1,000 times that, we would call that infinity. Everybody get to see the eye? Can I take this away? Go ahead. Okay. Um, let's look at various vision problems. Nearsightedness. Uh, this is called myopia or more commonly nearsightedness. Uh, this means that the uh, they can't people these people can't see far away things. So when we call it, when we say that it's nearsightedness, it really means that you can see things that, that are near. And farsightedness, on the other hand, will be you can see things that are far away. But these people can't see things that are far away. Uh, the reason is both of these, both nearsightedness and farsightedness, has only to do with the shape of your eyeball. So it means that your eyeball is either too long or it's too short. You can't really change that, right? I mean, I guess you, no, you can't change that. But it's just the shape of the eyeball that you're born with. So uh, for nearsighted people, the eyeball is too long. And they're, they're going to have a far point that's much too short. So their far point is typically about 20 to 30 centimeters. Right. They can't see things beyond 20 to 30 centimeters. So somebody that is nearsighted, when they want to see something, they don't hold it out here. They hold it like right up here to try to see it. Somebody that's nearsighted, because they physically can't see beyond 20 to 30 centimeters. Okay. Um, use a diverging lens to correct this. Because if you think about somebody with an eyeball that's too long, I'm going to exaggerate this. Say their eyeball is like this. And then if they try to look at something that's really far away, I have these parallel rays that will come in. The parallel rays will focus right here. And so the retina gets those rays after they pass their focal point, and it'll just produce a really fuzzy image or no image at all. Okay? So what you do to fix this is you take a diverging lens or a concave lens like this, and what it does is it takes your rays and it bends them out before they come into the eye, and then the eye focuses them at the back of the retina. 
So that diverging lens causes the li lens, they raise to diverge before they come into the convex lens of the eye. And then the convex lens will focus that at the focal point at the retina. So it'll give your, your combined system a, a longer focal point than what you would have otherwise. All right, so that is uh, myopia. Know what it is, right, how it affects people, and then also how to correct for it. The other is um, Oh, so you can see people if they have, you see people sometimes. Now, today they make glasses that are less obvious. But if you've ever seen somebody that looks like they have really thick glasses, they're probably because they have myopia, that they're nearsighted because their, their lenses will be really thick on the side and thin in the middle, right? We used to call those people like Coke bottle glasses or whatever, but that's when I was a kid and that was kind of mean. So don't make fun of people because of the glasses that they wear, okay? Yes, so contacts can also have a diverging or converging lens. It's just they're very thin, but they do the same thing. All right. Okay, so let's look at farsightedness. This is called hyperopia. Uh, can they s can they see far or near these people? They can see things that are far away. Uh, so they can't see close up objects. All right. So this is the person when they're reading the paper. They hold it like way out here because they can't see things that are really close to them. So far sightedness refers to what they can see. These people can see far, but they can't see things that are up close. Um, whereas with nearsightedness, the eyeball is too long. With hyperopia, the eyeball here is too short. All right, so I'll exaggerate this a little bit. There's my lens. There's my eye. It's a squish. It's sort of an oval looking like this, squish down, too short. And then if I have light rays that come <coughs> come in from an object that's really far away, the image will form back here. So in this case, my image forms behind the retina. And so you don't get an image at all. Because if you're trying to get your image right here, the rays don't cross, and you just get a really blurry image right there, or no image at all. So the eyeball is too short. Uh, remember with, um, oh, and for these people, their near point is farther away than normal. So whereas you can see your finger like right up to here, these people might not be able to see their finger, but like maybe out here, pretty far away. Uh, how am I going to fix this? What type of lens will I use? A converging or diverging? A converging, right. So uh, I'll put in a converging lens here. The light rays will come in. Let's get a different color. Light rays will come in. They will converge a little bit before they get to your eye. And then your lens will converge them the rest of the way down to your retina. So uh, to fix farsightedness or hyperopia, I use a convex lens in order to do that. It basically focuses the light a little bit before it gets into your lens, and then it focuses it the rest of the way. Uh, there are a couple of age-related problems as well. Can I go down from here, you Astigmatism. And presbyopia, we'll do presbyopia first. I go to Presbyterian church. It means elder, elder-led church. That's what presby means, elder. It's a Greek word for elder. Oh, not Presbyterian, sorry. I was thinking about something else. Uh, presbyopia. Uh, presbyopia. For old people... Are they nearsighted or farsighted? When you get old, what do you do? Right, they're farsighted. So old people are, is that bad to call them old people? No, okay, they're old. 
All right, so they're far-sighted. As you get older, uh, the lens just is not as good. So uh, the lens loses its flexibility. Because you remember, when you want to look at things that are up close, the lens inside your eye has to get really big in the middle. Right? My lens, I'm going to exaggerate it, but your lens has to get really big in the middle. That means your ciliary muscles are going to have to push down on it. But if your lens isn't very flexible, you're just not going to be able to do that. And so as your eye ages, as they say that once you pass 40 that you begin to develop this, this presbyopia, this farsightedness, when your lens just begins to lose its flexibility. You can see far away things. You cannot see nearby things. So your uh, near point then will increase. For farsightedness, what kind of lens do we use? A converging or diverging lens? Right. So to fix this, you go to the Walgreens and you buy some of those reading glasses. They're just converging lenses. Okay? So that's presbyopia. It's farsightedness, but it's caused by the lens just losing its flexibility. And then one more, astigmatism. It's kind of interesting. We'll watch a video about it. Astigmatism is an age-related thing, yes. Huh? Oh, wait, no, 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 I'm sorry. No, not the astigmatism. Uh, the astigmatism you can, you're born with, or you can be born with it, but it just means that, that your lens is not really a spherical lens, or it's not the same all over. So you might have light rays that come in, and they focus at one point. And then you get other light rays that come into a different part of the lens, and they focus at a different point. So you got two different points of focus back here uh, from your lens. Uh, so the astigmatism, the lens is not spherical. And the focal points are different at different parts of the lens. So you can get all sorts of different images. You can have images forming here. You can have images forming here, all over the back of the eyeball. And you can correct this. You can't just use a simple convex or concave lens, but you have to have a lens that's specifically fit for your eye to counteract those different focal points. So it's certainly correctable, but uh, it's more complicated than just for nearsightedness or farsightedness. All right. Uh, there are some other sections in your book that we're not going to do. Those include uh, other methods of vision correction. We're not going to do that. So if you're studying out of your book, which is a good idea, you don't need to worry about that section. And then there's another section called other problems, which we're not going to deal with. Okay? So you can just ignore those two sections in your book. But you do need to know all these different things, uh, the problems that people have with their eyes, and then also how you fix them. Okay? Let's watch a video, and then, actually, let's, yeah, we'll, we'll watch the video first, and then we'll do a few quicker questions. Okay, let's do, finish up the questions that we have. The light. Uh, do you recall where we left off here? Whereabouts? Yeah, we did. We do this one? Okay. Yeah, we have about eight more questions. So let's do that. Uh, light moves to a slab of glass. What is the path that it would take as it moves? The incident ray is right here. Will it take uh, path A, B, or C? Think about when it enters the glass. Will it move towards the normal or away from the normal? All right, we'll stop at uh, 40 seconds.
Okay, awesome. A is right. Yeah, so my light ray will bend towards the normal here. And then it bends away from the normal. Notice if it didn't bend at all, it would follow path B. And if it bent away from the normal, it would follow path C. Right? This would be different if uh, I was moving instead from air, from glass to air, right? So be careful on the type of medium that you're traveling to or from. Uh, let's see. Can I tell you all the Batman jokes? No? What? This is funny. Sorry. What did Batman say to Robin just before they got in the car? Get in the car. What? It's like, why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side? It's sort of a goofy answer. You get it? Which of these best describes the value of the index of refraction? Is n bigger than 1, n bigger than 0, less than 0, less than 1, or somewhere between negative 1 and 1? All right, we'll stop at uh, one minute. Okay, we're all over the board. So I'm just going to stop at one minute. I'll show you. Remember our index of refraction. Uh, the answer is A, by the way. Our index of refraction is equal to C divided by V, where this C is equal to the, the speed of light in a vacuum. And so my index of refraction, if I'm in a vacuum, then here V would equal to C if I was in a vacuum. And a vacuum is going to have the lowest index of refraction. So in a vacuum, N is equal to 1. And it can't go any lower than that because your index of refraction can't get any less than it is in a vacuum. There's just nothing in a vacuum to refract the air. And that's why the index is, is the lowest there. So here, uh, A is the right answer. When light enters a medium, that is, if it's in a vacuum and it enters a medium, what will it do? Will it speed up, slow down, or does it keep exactly the same speed? Okay. I have this. Uh, C is the speed of light in a vacuum. And this is the speed of light in whatever medium you're talking about. So if you want to give them subscripts, you can say this is nm and this is vm. The index of the medium, the index, the speed in the medium. Is that clear? Right. So if, if my medium is a vacuum, if my medium is a vacuum, then vm is equal to c if I'm in a vacuum. And for a vacuum, then, N is equal to 1. Is that more clear? Okay, good. All right, just a few more seconds on this. I'll stop at 110. Awesome. B is right. It slows down. What is Mozart doing right now? Decomposing. Virtual image, what are the which of these? Can be projected, has a negative image distance, has no magnification, or it cannot be seen. All right, we'll stop at uh, 45, 45. 
Oh, they're going to be as right. Let's skip the dirt on that one. Concave lenses produce what type of image? Only real, only virtual, or real or virtual? Concave. Remember, this is the one that's skinny in the middle. They, they shape out like this. They cave in. A concave lens produces what type of image? Only real, only virtual, or both, you know, in different scenarios. All right, we'll stop at 45. Oh, I'm sorry, stopped it already. Oh, uh, it's B. Concave lenses only produce virtual images. Uh, you can think about it because in order to produce a real image, my rays have to cross, but concave lenses cause my rays to diverge like this. And so they can never produce an image over here. They can never produce a real image. They're only going to produce virtual images. Uh, by the way, convex lenses, what would be the answer? C, right? A convex can produce either a real or a virtual. Oh. All right. I just said the answer to this, so just put it in if you like, if you remember it. I'll stop at uh, 20. That one doesn't count. I just said the answer just a second ago. All right, a convex lens has a focal length of a half a meter. What is its power? Half a meter, by the way. That's a long focal length, right? That's not like you would have with your glasses. But what is the power of this lens? All right, we'll stop at uh, 50. Okay, good. Remember, the power is just one over the focal length. So B is right. What did the dog say after a long day of work? Woof. Did I tell you all that one? I did. The focal length is equal to which of these? We'll stop at 35, 35. All right, that's right. Focal length is half the center of curvature R. The point will parallel rays focus. Two different ways to describe that. Virtual image always has or has a what image distance? Positive, negative, or zero for virtual. I'll stop at 25, 25. Okay, good. Hey, why was the obtuse triangle upset? Because it's never right. Uh, is that the last one? I thought I had more than that. Okay, I think there are more than that. I'll send them to you. Yeah, I'll send them to you with the answers. We're not going to do them in class, but they'll be good for you to review for the test. Next time, guys, we're going to start on that next chapter. If you want to go ahead and start reading through it, just read the first couple sections. We're not going to get that far into the chapter, but go ahead and start reading it. It's the one on nuclear radiation.